uh, I have my own personal interest in uh, critical care, echo, critical care, ultrasound, and uh, I'm doing anesthesia exam preparation courses for the last five years. Um, so please bear with me for this uh, coming 30 minutes uh, to talk about one of the most interesting topics. Uh, I presented maybe four years back in the channel, but this is a new dress for the same topic. So uh, before I start my talk, I would like really uh, to thank everyone here that asked about me and prayed for me. I do really appreciate your kind psychological support and your prayers as well, uh, which, was, which is the main reason for me being between you here today. Uh, yesterday I was in a very bad shape, so uh, forgive my uh, non-shaving uh, beard an uh, unshaved beard and uh, my look. It, it, it was really hard to make the time to prepare the lecture and appear as usual. Uh, tonight I'm uh, speaking about the, one of the commonest topic uh, topics that meets you in real life in anesthesia and subsequently would be in the exams. Uh, COPD patients, uh, you may find uh, it as a sole case, short case, or with other comorbidities. So if you can really understand what's happening, you can have a lot to write about this case. So first of all, I don't have any conflict of interest. Objectives of this lecture uh, will go quickly through the definition and pathophysiology of uh, COPD. Uh, and what's the difference between COPD and COED? Uh, is there any difference between them? Uh, what are the anesthesia concerns with this patient? How to plan and conduct a good plan of balanced anesthesia for COPD patients? Uh, what are the anesthesia-related problems for those patients, how to prevent them, and how to diagnose them quickly. Uh, and I will give you a good example of one of the most common procedures uh, done nowadays uh, for these uh, patients is one, it's called Chartis Assessment. What's the Charts Assessment? This is an assessment procedure done uh, intraoperative under uh, single human tube anesthesia with bronchoscopy, flexible bronchoscopy. It's uh, a preparatory session for an endobronchial valve treatment for, surg for, sorry, for emphysema. So I'll explain all what's happening in, uh, in the last slide of this presentation. Then we'll open a discussion about uh, this, uh, uh, this lecture. So uh, what is the name? Is properly COAD, chronic obstructive airway disease, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The old name was chronic obstructive airway disease, looking at its starts in the small airways, but it had a change it quickly to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, uh, because it has two main components. One is uh, alveolar, which is emphysema, or one is parenchymal, which is emphysema, and it is resulting from the airway disease. So it's not only the airways affected. Uh, so it's COPD is the commonest name and the most recent name. So that's why you may find COED in some uh, books, particularly the English books. So COPD is a very common, extremely common respiratory disease because the smoking is very common. Uh, severe COPD is, uh, particular severe COPD uh, carries uh, any type of surgery, even simple surgery, have a two year mortality around 47%. So after two years, you get almost half your patients died if they are not uh, assessed and treated properly. That's why this makes this lecture very important and uh, a topic in the exams. So it, your understanding of this makes a lot of difference. Uh, so significant risk of post-operative morbidity and especially pulmonary complications are very common as well. So if not died, you may suffer some pulmonary complications. However, uh, with risk identification, risk stratification, and preoperative optimization, and proper anesthetic planning, these risks for post-operative, particularly the pulmonary complications can be reduced even in patients with severe disease. So you can decrease the risk even with severe disease. Um, so what is the planned surgery? So let's have a look here first on the pathophysiology. 
So what's the definition of COPD or CAD? It's a progressive inflammatory disease. Uh, so it's not static, it's progressive in nature of the lung parenchyma characterized by airflow limitation that's not fully reversible. So it's an airflow limitation with partial or no reversibility. And is often accompanied and complicated by significant systemic manifestations and comorbidities. Components of this disease are mainly two components. One is obstructive component, one is the parenchymal component, which is emphysema. Uh, so sm small airway obstruction or uh, this restricted airway or uh, resistance of the airway, the small airways increase, causes a dynamic hyperinflation. Dynamic hyperinflation allows VQ mismatch. What is the VQ mismatch? It's the mismatch between the ventilation and perfusion because of poor ventilation, uh, because of air is trapped, it does not leak out, so there is no proper gas exchange. And with the dynamic hyperinflation of the airways, it will squeeze the uh, vessels or the vasculature between the alveoli, so that will cause, uh, again, another type of ventilation perfusion mismatch. So what is the VQ mismatch happening in the COPD patients? It's, is it dead space or is it chunk? It's actually a mix of both. Dead space, by definition, is the area that is not dead, means dead like a dead cat, with no flow. There is no blood flow. So how this happens in the COPD, because air trapping cause squeeze of the vasculatures or the blood supply between the increasing size the alveoli okay so the distension of the alveoli because of air trapping will squeeze certain areas with this squeeze there is no blood flow so these alveoli are are highly highly ventilated because there is over distension but they are not perfused so this is actually a dead space okay alternating with another alveoli that are poorly ventilated okay because very squeezed airways, these alveoli are not ventilated. So if there's alveoli that's not ventilated, but blood supply is passing good in between, so that's a shunt. So the bridging of blood without oxygenation. So actually the COPD is a mix of shunt and dead space, both in different lung segments. Okay, that's what creates the VQ mismatch. Uh, this hypoxemia, and hypercapnia resulting from this dead space and shunt will cause what we call core pulmonale with time. What is core pulmonale? So we'll go to the definition of core pulmonale, but it is kind of significant increase in the pulmonary artery pressure causing right-sided heart failure or right-sided high pressures and heart failure. There is another sequelae or, or consequences of uh, uh, COPD, like respiratory, skeletal muscles, wasting, muscle wasting, weight loss, and uh, cardiovascular, as we said, like uh, the core pulmonary. So these are considered extra pulmonary complications and manifestations, and you need to look for that. So now for my junior colleagues, I always advise classify or die and plan ahead uh, if you're preparing for your exam. For any patients, any patient at all, you are putting under anesthesia, I need you to think in this general approach. What are the considerations of this patient? How you do preoperative assessment? And what's your anesthetic plan and how you conduct your plan? So this is how you want to write about any patient you are putting asleep. So consideration, pathology, if this patient on any medications for this pathology, if there is any uh, drug-drug interaction between these medications and your drugs, uh, did this patient has any anesthesia troubles before and will this implement on your plan? What is the surgery he is undergoing today? Did he do any previous surgeries that may interrupt with your anesthetic plans? Uh, like did he have any uh, lung transplant, does he have any uh, single lung, does he have any tumors, does he have any any any, any previous surgeries he got for before? And is there any conflict between uh, these different elements or considerations and each other? This is like 
uh, we'll discuss that in details in our patient tonight as an example for that. Then the preoperative assessment, again, uh, the history related to your pathology, like COPD today, ample history, you can say anesthetic and allergies, uh, med medications. Sorry for that. I'm sorry, forgive me. Sorry for interruption. Uh, so the ample history, uh, the related, uh, uh, the drug related, sorry, we, we stopped here. Uh, past medical and post surgical history, the last meal, and E is events related to this admission. Is it a trauma patient or whatever? Uh, drug related history. So if this patient had any drugs uh, or uh, is he allergic to any medications or something like that, or he's on any medications, again, I need to know about maybe marijuana, maybe uh, whatever the drugs he's on may affect my induction plans. Uh, then examination, again, the routine examinations, airway assessment, okay? Uh, and then respiratory, cardiovascular, quick abdominal and lower limb edema is one of the routine exams. Then investigations, what is investigations you are putting for in general uh, and for different procedures? Then if you need to consult anyone or to do referrals to optimize the patient before admission to ICU, sorry, to anesthesia. So this is the preoperative assessment. Then the, the anesthesia plan now, I am planning this anesthesia plan in the pre-op assessment clinic. So this is not what I'm conducting. I'm still planning here. So am I going to put this patient under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia? Is it possible to do the regional if it is the best? Uh, airway versus aspiration, mother versus fetus, if any conflict like that in general. And then what you optimize, the pathology, the medications, what medications you need to give, what medication you need to stop before surgery. And any anesthesia related uh, issues needs to be optimized uh, before coming to theaters. Uh, and uh, options, is it general, regional, mix of both, whatever. Then the day of surgery, this is now the anesthesia conduct, and there is still a preoperative element of the anesthesia conduct. So this is a pre-op assessment and planning, okay? And this is conduct of anesthesia. Consent, uh, pre-medications given in the day of surgery, blood cross match it, the ICU high dependency unit bed or step down unit bed, uh, the room setup, the patient position, the lines, the medications, then you start here towards the end is the induction. So you have seen here a lot of things to write in your exam before you put your patient asleep. This is the induction, which is like, if you reach this degree, you got maybe 70% of uh, your answer already. Maintenance, fluid management, monitor, emergence. Uh, this is the recovery, uh, emergence and recovery for patient and where you will disposition your patient to where and what is your plan on this position. This is a general map if you're thinking about any patient. So let's tailor this map now on our COBD patients. So what are the considerations you need to do uh, to know what is the pathology? I spoke about VQ mismatch. This VQ mismatch is my patient is hypoxemic respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure or mix of both. Anyway, you need to know that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction may induce acute right-sided heart failure, and that's sometimes very hard to treat. So here the prevention is better than cure. So make all the effort to maintain uh, oxygenation in acceptable level. So what is the acceptable level that's tailored according to your patient? So it's not a bad idea when you're starting to induce your patient to put an arterial line when the patient is on room air and know what's his baseline PO2 and PACO2 on room air and don't use a lot of oxygen, like 100% oxygen. You can pre-oxygenate with 80 or 85% oxygen just to pre prevent absorption at elixis as long as you're achieving a good PO2. So as I said, hypoxia causes hypoxemic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And maybe if this happened as acute, it might cause precipitate or acute right heart failure, and that's sometimes very hard to treat. How you treat it if it happened? The best pulmonary vasodilator is oxygen, and if not, you can treat with other medications, but the best pulmonary vasodilator is oxygen, so oxygenate your patient well. And don't uh, be focused on the myth of 
uh, that if you give your patient oxygen or more oxygen, you will depress his respiratory drive and the patient will be apneic. Yes, he will be apneic because you're paralyzing him in a, in a minute or two because you're putting an endotracheal tube. So that is a concern after you start to wake him up, not during the induction of anesthesia. okay? So again, corporal monali is defined as an enlargement and right heart failure uh, due to systemic, sorry, due to vascular uh, um, sorry, due to uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction as a cause of uh, uh, severe pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, okay, so that causes right-sided high pressures. Right ventricle is not used to this high pressure because it is not a systemic circulation because it does not have the three layers of uh, muscles of the left ventricle. It does not have this big muscle mass. So you have to avoid increase of the pressure. So you have to avoid any increase in the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance and pulmonary arterial pressure. Okay. So pulmonary hypertension is one of the concerns. Again, if it is there, what is the pulmonary artery pressure? If you can find out that from an echo report or anything like that, or a right heart catheterization, it depends on his stage of uh, COPD, and we'll discuss that in a minute. Usually, because of their hypoxemia, there is a polycythemia. Polycythemia render them a hypercoagulable state. They are high instance of DVT and a hypercoagulable state may cause a low cardiac output in case of low flow. So you need to optimize your patient hydration. Uh, another uh, pathology is the bully. And if the patient has bulla, you need to figure out that there is a bulla before you put this patient asleep. Otherwise, if it ruptures, it will end up by a pneumothorax. And if it's bilateral, you may end up by tension bilateral pneumothorax and patient will die on table. So you need to know uh, that this is a concern with a COVD patient and your level of carboxyhemoglobin as well. Plus other uh, comorbidities because this patient, if the cause of the COPD, which is very common, is the smoking, uh, this is usually affecting more than one organ like cerebrovascular disease, or he has a cerebrovascular accident before, peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease. So if this patient has other comorbidities, because of the same etiology of COPD, which is the smoking. Okay, what is this patient medications? Is he compliant with his medications or not? Is he on steroids or not? What is the current medications? And what is the surgery? It is, a sim is it a simple surgery that can be done on the local or limb uh, regional anesthesia? Or this is something very serious uh, like uh, shared airway with a lot of manipulations like the chart assessment for endobronchial valve treatment for emphysema. So two extremes of surgeries uh, could be presented to you. So you need to importantly know and discuss with the surgeon what is the surgery. And is there any conflict between this uh, surgery and your anesthetic practice? I mean the conflict here, like if you're planning for uh, knee surgery that will take two and a half or three hours, and you are planning to put an epidural for this one, which is a fantastic plan, but actually your patient is unable to lie flat for a couple of hours, or he gets very uh, distressed after 30 minutes. So you need to discover that before you're putting, you're in, sticking an epidural needle in his back and put your, your plans, and then, and then you discover or you find out this patient actually cannot tolerate that. Uh, okay. So uh, this is what I mean by conflicts. So preoperative assessment for this patient history, uh, you need to find out how many exacerbations this patient got in the last few uh, months. Uh, or uh, he's never been in, admitted in a hospital or never had an exacerbation, or he is like doing it, having chest infection every one or two weeks, how many hospital admissions and previous requirement for invasive mechanical ventilation or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, what's his smoking history? Uh, is he still smoking? That's very bad. This is one of the worst outcomes. Try to stop or to make your patient stop smoking uh, as much as you can and as quick 
uh, and try to space at least eight weeks between your uh, cessation of smoking of the patient and the surgery because this is this carries the best outcome. So uh, again, you need to stop his smoking for like eight weeks before the surgery. That is the golden number. And uh, so uh, if the patient has active sputum, this will trigger uh, the, the bill of uh, active infection. So do CRP, white cell count. If the CRP is high, white cell count is high and the patient has green sputum, that's an active infection please don't go to theater with this patient unless it's really emergency procedure, okay? So this patient has an active chest infection which carries the highest mortality here. So uh, what are the other morbidities? Like if there is any core pulmonary, any heart failure, uh, and, and it needs to be treated before that, you need to optimize his, his uh, core pulmonary and heart failure before uh, you go ahead with the surgery. Uh, Okay, nutrition, if the patient is a smoker and COPD, I believe it is not uncommon to find he's not taking care of his diet well and maybe malnourished. So you have again to think about this one uh, before you put him asleep. Uh, the body habitus during your examination is uh, interestingly in one of the extremes, either he's cachectic, malnourished, because he is a chronic smoker, he's smoking like 40, 50 a day, so uh, the anorexia and nausea associated with this one prevents him from eating well, or he is on steroids and repeated chest infections and, and, and repeated steroids will be overweight. So you usually see either very cachectic patient or very obese patient, the COPDs. Okay, so uh, chest examination, you cannot put a patient asleep without examining his chest uh, very well. And uh, when you examine please do front and back and, and, and be very careful with your examination. What you need to auscultate is a bronchospasm. So this is an active uh, bronchospasm. This, this patient needs an active management, escalating his bronchodilators and his steroids. So refer him to the pulmonologist to control that before you put him asleep. And crepitations, and that means a chest infection. Lung ultrasound is of good help in this occasion. You can diagnose active pneumonias and active uh, atelectasis. Uh, and um, there is no diagnosis of, of asthma in the blue protocol except with diagnosis of exclusion. So if it's just uh, bronchospasm, it's your stethoscope rather than the ultrasound. Again, examine the heart well, heart and its uh, related uh, organs and structures. So look at the jugular veins, uh, look at the tender congested liver, but look at the lower limb edema then investigations to support your theory if this patient is okay to go ahead or he has a chest infection like if you find white cell count as i said high uh, abgs as i mentioned it's not a bad idea for any like moderate surgery or significant surgery uh, to do an arterial blood gases at baseline room air before you put uh, anything. So avoid giving any sedation before your arterial line. Be generous with local anesthetics to put an arterial line. And CO2 more than 5.9 kilopascals, and you can convert that into millimeters mercury by multiplying by 7.5, or and PO2 less than uh, 7.9 kilopascals on room air are both associated with the worst prognosis. So your 5.9 and 7.9 uh, more and less is uh, your, uh, your golden numbers here. So X-ray is very important for any patient with active COPD or is still smoking. So it diagnoses infection, or if this infection with chronic irritation of his lung parenchyma change it into malignancy and to rule out any bully, as I said, uh, because it will uh, imply on my uh, ventilation plans. Uh, ECG, you're looking for any arrhythmias. Uh, atrial fibrillation is not uncommon with those kind of patients and right ventricular uh, hypertrophy or high, uh, and strain pattern. If you are suspicious, Suspicious with your ECG uh, pattern, so okay, go away, go ahead uh, for an echocardiography, particularly if you have any other comorbidities. Uh, pulmonary function testing, are we doing that for all uh, COBD patients? No, this depends on the history uh, and the 
physical tolerance of the patient. Uh, so you can ask him how many minutes you can uh, walk on the, on a flat surface, how many flights of stairs, and if he's getting short of breathing uh, quickly enough, so that will ring the bell and ask for a pulmonary function test. And as you see here, this is the normal pattern and this is the COPD pattern with airflow limitation. This is the residual volume. This is the normal tidal volume. And this is the total lung capacity from here to here. Okay, so this is residual volume. So you cannot expirate or you cannot expire this amount of air, if you remember this from the physiology. So this volume cannot go out until here. And this is the uh, uh, residual, sorry, this is the normal tidal breath, and this is the total lung capacity from here to here. So this is a flow, uh, a flow volume uh, curves. So this is the volume on on the on the x-axis, and this is the flow on the uh, on the y-axis. Okay. So we'll discuss what are the gold criteria in the next slide. But if you have this flow pattern, and you feel that there is a reversible element in this patient, and there is always a reversible element. You can look at what is the post-bronchodilator uh, um, flow volume curve appearance, and you can refer that to the pulmonologist, and if there is any suspicion about core pulmonary and heart failure, you can refer him again to the cardiologist as well. So what is the goal? The goal is a global initiative uh, for chronic obstructive lung disease. Okay, so this is the gold criteria. So your stage in the patient is one, two, three, four stages. All the four stages are uh, the same from FEV1 divided by FVC. FEV1 is a forced expiratory volume in the first second. FVC is a forced vital capacity. If you divide the first by second and you get less than 70%, you're by definition have a COPD, but what is degree? So that is classified according to the forced expiratory volume in the first second. If it is more than 80%, you are a mild. Okay, if you're 50 to 79%, that's your grade two or gold, gold grade two. 30 to 49%, you are gold three and less than 30% you are gold four. If you are lying in this stage, gold three and gold four, your patient is lying in this stage, it carries very high mortality and morbidity needs optimization. Possible need for ICU bed, if not HDU bed, and he may need post operative mechanical ventilation. So you need to know and judge your patient well according to these criteria, you need to be aware of them. As I said, uh, so here, uh, the conflict, GA versus regional anesthesia. So some people think that regional anesthesia is the gold standard for COPD patient all the time, but uh, I can show you this uh, publication, 100% incident of hemidiaphragmatic paresis associated with interscaline brachial plexus uh, anesthesia as diagnosed by ultrasonography. Now, uh, recently, there were few case reports about uh, the magic technique of nerve sparing regional anesthesia uh, for pain management or for regional anesthesia for shoulder surgery. And I think there is no so far any uh, uh, strong study recommends that we can use interscaline uh, blocks for shoulder uh, surgery in patient with uh, at least uh, moderate and severe uh, stages of COPD or gold three and four. Uh, but there is a still a lot of discussions, few case reports about these uh, new approaches with phrenic nerve spacing, sparing effect. Uh, but I, I would be surprised if something comes quick soon. Uh, so smoking cessation, this is now we are in the third box, which was A, B, C, the down left box, which is uh, how to plan and optimize your patient. As I said, smoking cessation is the first advice, the most strong advice you have to give to your uh, smoking patient, particularly if he's a COPD, uh, because uh, it carries lower mortality if he stops eight weeks uh, before the surgery. So eight weeks, remember this figure. Uh, if the patient uh, is uh, cooperative enough, preoperative chest physiotherapy, if he has a chest infection, uh, he has to have to send him for the pulmonologist to treat his, him by antimicrobials, 
optimize his beta agonist and uh, give him anticholinergic. You can give those in the day of surgery, but please be aware of back-to-back -back nips is not a good option in the day of surgery because it will precipitate his uh, arrhythmias, particularly with the induction. So one dose is good enough in the day of surgery just before arrival to operating theater if your patient is COPD. And we're talking about 2.5 or 5 milligrams of salbutamol nebulization. And if that did not happen, we have a nice uh, invention, which is a 50 cc syringe. Okay, but we are not injecting the salbutamol with this syringe. We're using the buff uh, or the inhaler and taking out of its box and putting in the 50 cc syringe and attached to the small nozzle, uh, a 14 gauge IV cannula and use that as injector to be used in his endotracheal tube. Uh, so you can give him three to five buffs in the endotracheal tube if he didn't get a beta agonist, beta two agonist uh, before the surgery. Uh, anticholinergics uh, are good, but still they dry in the mucus uh, and make him mucus plugging uh, and, and may precipitate atelectasis more. So I would avoid anticholinergic in, in the day of surgery. Or if he got his anticholinergic, you can maintain his good hydration, which is a bit tricky because if you are overhydrating this patient, again, uh, this um, uh, increasing intravascular, uh, extravascular lung water will be a bit challenging in extubation as well. Uh, steroids. Uh, Remember that this patient, if he is on prednisolone at home, you need a stress dose of steroids in the day of surgery. And the uh, five milligram prednisolone can, uh, if this is routine of the patient, five milligram of prednisolone per day, you can give him hydrocortisone uh, 50 milligrams as a stress dose of steroids, not 150 should be enough, okay? Uh, the options again, if the epidural analgesia is an option in this patient, it's a fantastic pain free post-operative period. So uh, if you use that, uh, it will help a lot in uh, pain management, decreasing the narcotics or the uh, morphine used post-operatively and helping uh, the balance between uh, pain-free and respiratory depression, depression or depressant effect of the narcotics, uh, which will facilitate his extubation easily. Uh, I'm aware and conscious of the time, so we'll go a little bit faster here. So anesthesia conduct now, you need to mention in your consent, which I know that most of anesthesia procedures are running and depending only on the surgical consent, but you need to mention uh, before you put your patient asleep uh, that there is a possibility of post-operative mechanical ventilation, particularly if he's a gold three or gold four, and there may be like longer periods of and challenging period of extubation after uh, the surgery, particularly if it is uh, uh, dorsal lumbar uh, surgeries. Uh, Pre-medications uh, uh, as well, bronchodilators, antimicrobials, if the patient is on baseline antimicrobials, which, which is a lot of patients from this kind are on, you will maintain his uh, baseline antimicrobials plus the surgical uh, prophylaxis. Uh, blood cross-matching and type is is really related to uh, the surgery. It's not related to the COPD. Uh, but you you make your transfusion trigger uh, always the seven because of his hemo hemo, hemo concentration and uh, uh, and his uh, polycythemia in the beginning. Uh, ICU and HDU bed is required for any gold standard uh, more than two, so three and four. Uh, room setup, the position is the same uh, for any surgery, but consider if you're giving regional anesthesia and the surgery is long time enough that you make sure that this patient can stay in that position. Particularly, you cannot give any conscious sedation for this patient. Otherwise, you would end up with hypoventilation and deeply, deeply comatose, airway not protected, and you will need to intubate him towards the end in a bad circumstances. So plan ahead what you are doing. Uh, lines, as I said, a line awake for sampling uh, baseline, intra and post-operative, and dispatching this decision. So if you find your baseline is six uh, kilopascal, his CO2, six kilopascals, and uh, now post-operatively his CO2 is 10 uh, because of residual effect of narcotics or whatever reason, now you know that this patient should be in a monitored area like step down or high dependence unit. Uh, central line will be left as for the surgery 
uh, more than anything else. Again, uh, induction, uh, regional anesthesia, opioids, I prefer, and it's always in the text, uh, that you should prefer short-acting opioids rather than the long-acting opioids. And there's a very fine balance between good analgesia and respiratory depression. You can use magnesium sulfate as an adjuvant. It will be very helpful in the bronchodilation and adjuvant analgesia. You can use ketamine as well particularly if your patient is a middle age group up to 65 years, you can use ketamine uh, freely. So it will help as a bronchodilator, good analgesia. Uh, so multimodal analgesia with the lowest amount of uh, long acting opioids. So we'll continue here again with anesthesia uh, conduct, airway and breathing, uh, use the largest endotracheal tube size to allow suction and the bronchoscopy if required. Uh, put your endotracheal tube when the patient is deep enough. Uh, so best monitor is uh, preferred uh, to confirm your patient is deep enough uh, in case you develops bronchospasm. Uh, Ventolin buffs again with the 50 cc syringe connected to the 14 gauge IV cannula. Uh, I mean the cannula, the plastic cannula without the needle. And this will give three buffs through endotracheal tube magnesium sulfate, deep in the anesthesia, extubate your patient pain-free, wide awake. Uh, again, if the patient had developed any VQ mismatch intraoperatively discovered by your blood gases, always consider uh, your atelectasis as the main indication for that and mucus plugging. So do uh, some uh, saline nips, do good suctioning, increase the beep, but be very judicious with the beep because if the patient has a bullet, it may rupture. Uh, avoid high FiO2 to avoid the absorption at lexis. Avoid the hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Ultrasound is very helpful uh, in diagnosis and differential diagnosis between a chest infection and at lexis, between the static and dynamic air bronchograms, if you are aware, are aware. Okay, if the patient has sputum plugging, the key diagnostic point here is you find normal plateau pressure with a high peak airway pressure with a difference more than 10 uh, centimeters uh, of water, sorry, 10 millimeters of mercury. So if the difference between the peak and plateau is more than 10 with the plateau normal and high airway pressure, high peak airway pressure. This is a resistance problem in this patient. Consider sputum plugging. Again, do some saline nips, humidified air, good suction, and uh, recheck his airway pressures again. Uh, pneumothorax, if this had happened, you need to uh, again diagnose it. Again, you will find the plateau pressure is high, plus the peak airway pressure will be high. So this is a compliance problem, okay? You need to minimize your PEEP and do a uh, five, uh, fifth intercostal space, uh, mid clavicular, uh, sorry, second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, needle decompression followed by 50 intercostal uh, space, anterior axillary line uh, decompression by intercostal drain. Uh, so you have still to keep monitoring uh, continuously your peak and plateau pressures. Uh, circulation, again, you need to uh, be very judicious with your fluid uh, management. So uh, look at the trends of the patient. Look, if you have an arterial uh, pressure, you can look at the uh, uh, PIP or uh, uh, the pulsatility index and if there is fluid responsiveness or not. Look at the jugular veins, if it was starting by flat and now it's congested, the patient looks congested. So look at the trends all the time. If you have a central line, look at the CVP in the beginning on the same peep and then look at the end if your patient needs fluids or not. Be again using all the parameters together, clinical and regular. Uh, so, uh, for maintenance, you, you need to put your patient at full exhalation time. So keep IE ratio one to two, or sometimes one to 2.5 to allow for full expiration. The monitors should be according to the AEGBI guidelines. But again, I recommend always put on the ventilator, the pressure, volume, loops, and curves. Here, this is uh, the difference between auto-peep and no auto-peep. If your 
this is the flow curve, so the flow and time. If the flow is going to the zero and then starting a new cycle, there is no auto peep. If your flow is not reaching the zero and then starting a new cycle, that means there was a continuous flow. Patient was still exhaling, and then you started here a new cycle before the end of exhalation. So you need to prolong his expiratory time until this happens completely plus the bronchodilators, plus the magnesium sulfate, plus, 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 plus. But you need to keep an eye on the flow time curve. And here, this is the flow volume curve or the flow volume loop, if I could use the correct setting. So normally it goes here, expiration goes to the zero and then start a new inspiration and then go to the expiration to the zero. So if you find your volume pressure, uh, sorry, volume flow uh, loop is ending here, then starting again the new cycle before the full exhalation. This is an indicator that this patient has an auto peep. So the treatment here is again, bronchodilators increase the expiratory time, decrease the respiratory rate, allow him to exhale first, and you may allow for some permissive hypercapnia because if this uh, air trapping or auto peep happens, you'll find your patient suddenly became shocked and if that happened, you need to suddenly disconnect from the ventilator to allow all the air trapped in his lungs to leak outside the lungs. Uh, this is in case of emergence of the patient and patient has uh, started to be hypoventilated. You can have a lock with ultrasound diaphragm here too. This is, uh, you can assess the diaphragm with thickness. You can assess the diaphragmatic thickening fraction and diaphragmatic excursion, and this is in particularly, if you used if you used the baseline of the patient and you did interscaline block or regional anesthesia, and then you send the patient outside in the recovery room and you find the patient is hypoventilated, you want to rule out the phrenic nerve paralysis. So if you have his baseline before your block on the diaphragm, you can repeat that and compare your baseline to what's happening after to see if your phrenic sparing regional anesthesia had worked out or not. You can add ABGs and chest X-ray as well to see if there is any ruptured pulla uh, or anything as a cause from his COPD. Uh, this position of this patient, I prefer this patient to be in HDU, high dependency unit, if they are gold three or four. Sometimes you need even to send them to the ICU mechanically ventilated, intubated for one or two days. But keep an eye on early mobilization of this patient, good hydration, good analgesia, allow him to breathe as fast as you can spontaneously and get the tube out as fast as you can. Maintain normal PO2 and CO2. DVT prophylaxis is not only chemical prophylaxis, it's the early mobilization and the good hydration of this patient. So I'll end up here with a chartist procedure or charts assessment for endobronchial valve uh, treatment. So the idea, if you have a ball in, in the chest, they put a valve, one-way valve that allows air to leak out of the bolla but not in. So it's this is a one-way valve here that allows air to leak out from this bolla and no air allowed in. So do you want to discover if we put this valve is the fissure between uh, the upper and middle loop or the middle and lower loop is this fissure is an intact fissure or there is not it's not an intact fissure if the fissure is not intact actually there will be leakage from the fissure from one loop to the other loop so this will be a failed procedure because the valve will be functioned less because the air is coming from another loop so the whole idea of this uh, chartist assessment is to detect if my loops are intact loops with the fissure intact or not. So this is uh, the, the balloon that they put here and they keep this balloon inflated. And the balloon is actually accompanied by a fenestration here at the side of this uh, one. So it allows air to leak outside, but no air going in. So it is the same function of the valve, but there is a sensor here towards the inside allowing to see if there is any flow coming back or not. So here you see there's no flow, no flow, no flow, sorry. So if there's no flow coming, the flow is going one way, that means there is no air coming via the fissure from the other loop. So this is a predictor of successful uh, endobronchial valve treatment. If you find this is the shape so there is a still flow and they will leave that for three to five minutes and still there is flow uh, coming in and out. So this means the fissure is not intact. So 
if you put a valve in this patient, there will be uh, of no value. So you're just exposing this patient to the surgery without any uh, benefit. So this is what we call, it's it's a new procedure. Uh, it, it, it is, this is one of the publications in uh, 2020. Uh, it's it's a very new procedure, but it's it's gone viral because it, it, it helps a lot of patients uh, and it improves pulmonary functions after uh, this bulla. Uh, uh, surgery, it's like a medical bullectomy uh, rather than surgical one. So it is accompanied by better uh, post-operative mortality and morbidity compared, compared to surgical procedure. You can read more about this one. I think it, it, it's possible to have it in one of your exams uh, if they are interested with the new procedures. And I hereby finish uh, my talk and your questions are very welcome. Thanks very much for listening. Okay, so I have a question here says, what is ample history? Uh, you can easily Google it, but it is uh, taken as either uh, allergies, uh, medications, P, past history, you can classify that as past medical and past surgical under two items. Uh, L is the last meal in case of emergencies, you consider your patient is still fasting. Uh, e is the events re related or uh, or events uh, caused this patient to come to anesthesia is a surgical procedure uh, uh, in an instance. Like if he's a trauma patient, how did he fall? Did he lose his consciousness? If it is uh, a uh, uh, bowel obstruction, since how long? So you get details about the surgical procedures that's gonna happen now. Okay, let me see if there's any more questions here. Okay, I hope you're satisfied now, uh, Artemad, uh, about my answer about ample history. Uh, could you describe again the method of administrating ventolin? ventolin? Yes, so uh, the ventolin is coming in a buffer, okay? If you remove this buffer, you will find uh, um, uh, the buffing uh, vial inside. So you will apply this one between uh, the plunger and the syringe. So you will open the plunger and put this vial inside. And then you will put the blunger in back again, as if you are injecting the drug. But you are not injecting that intravenous. You will attach the cannula, which is 14 gauge cannula, without the needle to the nozzle of that syringe. So this will create a syringe with the puffer inside. And this cannula is attached anteriorly. So you can put this uh, inside the intracale tube reaching almost third of the distance of intracale tube and give three to five buffs of this ventilin nebulization if the patient develops uh, a bronchospasm. This is one of the treatments of the bronchospasm if it happens intraoperatively or after intubation, uh, plus the magnesium sulfate, plus the ketamine can be used, plus the zeofluorine definitely. Zeofluorine is a, one of the very important, uh, uh, potent drugs uh, of bronchodilatation. Okay, I hope that's answered. Uh, can you repeat the correction from, uh, okay, so the correction from kilopascals to uh, millimeters mercury is multiplied by 7.5. So I know that most people in the Middle East are using the millimeter mercury. Uh, you can like four kilopascals are 30 millimeters of mercury or, or six would be 45. So that because we are using in Europe, uh, the, the, the kilopascals, not the millimeters mercury. Uh, best analgesic plan if epidural is not possible. Uh, thanks, Mohammed, for this interesting question. So it depends on the procedure you are doing. So um, every procedure has its analgesic plan, but I think multimodal analgesia is the idea behind. So always use paracetamol routinely six hourly in the post-operative period, 48 to 72 hours. Uh, always use multimodal analgesia in the term of add magnesium uh, and uh, intraoperatively 20 to 30 milligrams of ketamine. Uh, use short acting opioids uh, for COPD patients. You can use long term opioids in a minimal uh, dosage plus the regional anesthesia and blocks if it is safe enough to do. As I said, gold three and four are contraindicated for uh, uh, sobraclavicular blocks, interscaline. Uh, or uh, uh, whatever the block you would like. Uh, I hope that's answered as well. Can you repeat? Okay. 
Thanks so much, Dr. Negri. Uh, okay, is non-steroidal contraindicated? That's a very nice question, uh, Muhammad. I really like it. So for asthma and COBD patient, I tend to ask them, did you get any ibuprofen or uh, non-steroidal by name uh, before? How is your tolerance to that? Uh, but as I, th as I said, this patient is usually a multi-comorbid uh, patient. So you may find another uh, renal disease, chronic or coronary artery disease, uh, previous stroke. So if you find this comorbidities, I would try to avoid the non-steroidals as much as I can, but it is not absolutely contraindicated if the patient is getting them before and tolerated them. Uh, okay, so two patients, two, sorry, two physicians, two colleagues asking about the same question about magnesium sulfate. What is the dose? I'm giving two grams of uh, magnesium sulfate as routine that can be doubled uh, provided uh, you need to. So the baseline is 2 to 2.5 uh, grams of magnesium sulfate in a 100 ml bag. Okay, that can be infused over 30 minutes or maximum one hour. So like it's it's a safe drug, provided you keep an eye on the blood pressure. If you need to repeat that, it's fine. You can repeat that up to five grams. If you need to repeat more than five grams, I would advise and strongly advise you do the patellar test before you do that. If you find any hyporeflexia on the patellar reflex, don't uh, don't do that again or you have to monitor his magnesium sulfate, his magnesium levels before you do that again, okay? Um, so, and do an ECG as well. Uh, two. IV bronchodilators, yes. So the current evidence says that the uh, IV uh, Salbutamol and aminophelin and all these drugs are not superior to any of uh, the medications we give. And I feel that the challenge about the bronchodilators may be in emergency department, maybe in the medical ward, but not in anesthesia, because in anesthesia, you have the magic drug, which is uh, sevoflurane. Um, so sevoflurane is a strong and potent uh, bronchodilator. If you combine that particular with the magnesium, ketamine, and other drugs that we have, I rarely needed uh, to give uh, the aminophilin or salbutamol as IV. I, I rarely require that. I think it's one in, once, once in my life as well. Uh, ketofol dosing, infusion, I am not uh, familiar with ketofol. I think ketofol is like as a preparation mixed Pre-mixed together is only available in the states. To my knowledge, I'm not sure about that one. I don't have any input in this question. Uh, is all the smoking are equal like vaping and shisha to cigarettes? Uh, yes, I can say uh, cigarettes is um, the worst worst comorbidities in the term of uh, mucus production and mortality and morbidity was done uh, on the cigarette smoking and shisha smoking, but uh, the recent vape. I had seen reports that's catastrophic on the vape. Vaping is a killer uh, in different uh, modality, which is, um, it. you don't know what is the content of the vaping actually compared to the cigarettes. And there's a lot of um, anesthesia related uh, mortalities in young people with no other comorbidities. I had read a lot of reports myself uh, so it's 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 worse, much much worse compared to the cigarettes and shisha. Uh, uh, shisha smoking because of the long tubing system uh, causes more COPD and causes uh, bully bully formation quicker than uh, cigarette smoking. But I think all I don't know. I'm not really aware of the difference between them. Uh, Dexmethamphetamine. Uh, I, I think that dexometromethidine has a tiny, if any, bronchodilator effect. So it can be added as uh, an analgesic if you're asking about the analgesic effect, but again, very weak analgesia. You can add uh, clonidine or dexometromethidine uh, as uh, part of a multimodal analgesia, but I don't think from analgesia point of view, it adds a lot. Uh, okay, if an O2B developed uh, 
how you manage. Okay, the first thing you need to do is to release the tube from the ventilator to allow this trapped air all to leak outside before you do anything else. Number two, you need to allow for less respiratory cycles to decrease the respiratory rate, increase the IE ratio, and treat the underlying cause of the O2 peep, which is the bronchospasm. How you treat that is bronchodilators, as I said, bronchodilators, salbutamol, and uh, anticholinergic like aprotropium, uh, magnesium sulfate, and ketamine, sevoflurane, all this can be used as bronchodilators. Uh, whatever you want to do that, but you need to do something with very quick effect to allow as low expiratory rate as you can. And you can even allow for permissive hypercapnia rather than uh, air trapping and bottle trauma. Uh, can I have a record of this uh, presentation? Definitely. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, all uh, the presentations and all the lectures are available in uh, uh, savinglivesacademy.com, uh, hopefully soon, inshallah. Uh, thanks very much again. Uh, thanks to Richard. Do you want to ask anything, Dr. Walid? If you unmute yourself, please. Shukran, Dr. Walid. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Magdi Khalil, please don't Amin. ask. <laughs> Do you want any, uh, uh, any very, questions? Very, very fruitful information. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Hazim Yassin, our colleague here, thanks. We see you after a long time again. Uh, very good to see you. I know you came for me. <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, any questions? Okay, perfect. So now I think I forgot actually to put the polling for the second lecture. So I put the poll. Forgive me if I, I didn't make it that good. Uh, <coughs> I leave this poll for just one minute and then we'll close. Uh, during this minute, any comments, please feel free. Dr. Magdi, Dr. Hazem. No. Perfect. Thanks a lot. See you next week, inshallah. Okay, see you next week, inshallah. And uh, I don't recall what are the lectures of the next week, but I think uh, there is an interesting lecture by Dr. Ahmed Abdel Manam, uh, Anesthesia for Thoraco Abdominal Aortic uh, Surgeries. So he is one of the interested people in this field. So I, I'm sure you will enjoy that. Okay, so perfect. So I'm ending the poll here with 83% voted. Thanks a million. Thanks so much. Very good. So see you next week, inshallah. Salam alaikum. One second. Just one right. question here. Oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. It's not a question. So thanks and see you next week. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.